Market to Market is everywhere you are. Subscribe to Market to Market on YouTube, find us on the PBS video app to stream on demand, and add our three podcasts on your favorite podcasting app. Coming up on Market to Market, preparing for one more legal fight on Prop 12, sorting out the details on the 2023 Farm Bill, making tough choices in another year of drought. Look at corn and its tendency. And market analysis with Sue Martin, next. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics or meteorology or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Sukup Manufacturing Company, providing equipment and buildings to store and condition grain to help farmers adjust to market swings. We build drying, moving, and storage equipment designed to preserve the quality of their crops. Sukup Manufacturing, store now, profit later. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. This is the Friday, June 10 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Paul Yeager. Another 1981 reference this week. The last time the inflation rate rose this much, the Oakland Raiders beat the Philadelphia Eagles in Super Bowl 15. The consumer price index rose 8.6% year over year, according to the Labor Department. The monthly rate went up a full percent with higher rents, gas, and food prices. When the volatile components are removed, the core reading added six tenths of a percent. The Ag Economy Barometer from Purdue University and the CME Group dropped 22 points. Producers' perceptions on current and future expectations weakened in May. Work on the next farm bill continued this week. Two of the biggest issues addressed in the legislation were under review. The safety net for producers and food assistance programs. David Miller reports. Your, your time and your on Wednesday, today, the Subcommittee uh, on Nutrition, Oversight and Department Operations morning. invited witnesses to discuss the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP. When people don't have the money to buy food, we know what happens, they're still going to find a way to get food. And what we see when they can't afford the food, we see it in our stores today increasing because of inflation, the price of gas, housing and everything else, is that we see our theft go up. The 2018 Farm Bill allocated an estimated 75 percent of its budget to food assistance programs, including SNAP. The experts invited to the hearing asked the committee to make changes to SNAP that would modernize the program and decrease barriers to entry. Another key piece um, for the center is the three-month time limit for unemployed uh, adults with, without children in their home. This is just a harsh time limit, and ha there's no research that shows um, taking away from food from people is going to make them be able to work. USDA statistics reveal that one in eight Americans are food insecure. According to the department, 41 million are currently being assisted by SNAP at a cost of roughly $9 billion per month. It's required to produce crops. On Thursday, the Subcommittee on General Farm Commodities and Risk Management met to talk about two titles for the 2023 Farm Bill, commodity loss payments and crop insurance. This administration has clearly shown their lack of regard for the full-time farmers and ranchers that produce our food. And instead of going on Jimmy Kimmel, Perhaps the administration could remove the excise tax on diesel fuel and reduce the cost of farming. Over the past year, potential producer profits have been bolstered by bullish futures markets, which kept the current safety net of ARC and PLC payments from kicking in. What's an appropriate metric we should be using to evaluate how the safety net should be structured? Prices are going to decline, but the input prices are going to stay up for a while, and they always do. And, and that's going to leave people in, a, in a, what we call a cost price squeeze. And, and so either looking at some sort of margin or building in the ability to move, ratchet up uh, the, the reference price with uh, costs is, is my uh, suggestion. More hearings will be held in the coming months.
before a markup on the 2023 Farm Bill will be scheduled in the full committee. For Market to Market, I'm David Miller. A new 8,000 head beef slaughter plant has been proposed for Rapid City, South Dakota. The facility could be operational as early as 2023. Also that same year could see news impacting the pork industry and how it raises animals. The Supreme Court is poised to hear arguments on California's Proposition 12 later this year with a ruling to follow. The case again was a topic of conversation at one of the industry's largest gatherings. Peter Tubbs files this report from the World Pork Expo. The 2022 Pork Expo returned to the Iowa State Fairgrounds in Des Moines, Iowa this week, and the sunny skies belied a potentially cloudy forecast for a legal case that hangs over the industry. At the annual event, Officials with the National Pork Producers Council laid out their challenge to California's controversial Proposition 12. The 2018 ballot initiative mandates minimum space requirements for breeding sows and other farm animals that produce offspring that are eventually sold as meat in the Golden State. However, after nearly four years, no specific regulations have been finalized. The NPPC's lawsuit has been considered to have merit and will be on the docket to be argued before the United States Supreme Court in the coming session. Proposition 12 is close to a per se case of uh, an unconstitutional extraterritorial law, as you're going to find. The, you know, the first type of this case that the Supreme Court has taken up in literally decades. You have a state that produces zero pork that passed a regulation, passed a law with the intent of applying it outside of the state and imposing its will on pork producers that are 100% located outside the state. And that is not allowed under the U.S. Constitution. The case will hinge on the limits of the laws of one state affecting business practices in other states. Iowa can have its own laws regulating its own citizens and its own businesses. New York can have its own laws regulating its own citizens and its own businesses. And another state can't impose its regulatory reach into those states. We feel very confident in our chances and uh, look forward to uh, bringing our case to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court calendar for the 2022-2023 session has yet to be released. For Market to Market, I'm Peter Tubbs. California's Central Valley has also been known as the nation's salad bowl. Del Bosque Farms has played host to a president, several governors, and other congressional and state-level representatives. Labor and food issues often come up for Del Bosque, but there is one item that always tops the list. Our conversation is part of the next MTOM podcast and is also this week's cover story. Uh, sometimes we talk about trade. Um, but by and large, the biggest topic is, is water, because for most farmers here in the Central Valley, that's, that's their biggest concern. Labor is for those of us who grow fresh fruits and vegetables, but everybody here in, in, the, in California, actually, all the farmers need water. You are pretty much right in the central of Central Valley. Is that accurate? Yes, I'm on the west side, but in the central part of, of, the, of the San Joaquin Valley, you know, Central Valley is really two valleys, San Joaquin and Sacramento. San Joaquin is the larger one, um, and I'm kind of in the closer toward the middle, yes. And your farm, what is behind you over your right shoulder there? These are cantaloupes right here behind me. And what's to your left then? And on the left, if you can see that, is a fallow field. Basically, we planted, we tried to plant some grain or cover crop there and hope that the rain waters it, but we didn't. So some of it came up and just died. So there's no crop there. We're just, it's just something that if we get rain, we get something, but there was nothing. So it's important to understand that here in California, you know, we don't, we don't depend on what rain falls here, really. These melons don't depend on rain that falls here. They don't want rain. They don't want rain right now. We're dependent on rain that falls in the north part of the state, is captured in a reservoir, saved and brought to us when we need it and where we need it. And that's the way it is, not just for agriculture, but also for, for urban areas. Um, you know, Southern California gets a lot of their water from 
Sacramento Valley, and so to, and uh, and the Bay Area gets a lot of water from the uh, from the Eastern Sierra Nevada or Central Sierra Nevada. So we all in California are dependent on a man-made water system that captures the rain or snow melt, saves it for when we need it, and then we have a system of canals and, and so forth to distribute it. What's the status of that reservoir right now? I just happened to go by San Luis yesterday and I stopped there. Um, it's at 44% of capacity, uh, which is very low for this time of year. You know, typically uh, it fills up about, uh, about the end of March or early April, and then it starts to come down slowly. But it never got full this year. Uh, it only got up to about 60 or 60 some percent full. And it's been draining ever since because as, as the temperature gets hot, people use more water. And, and of course, agriculture irrigates more uh, as temperatures rise. I think I saw maybe Sacramento, was it back in March, had a 90 degree temperature? It was the earliest 90. Is that right? There were some very high temperatures back in March, and so that created a lot of snow melt, and typically snow stays up there in the mountains till about this time of year, and then it starts to trickle down. But because temperatures were so high, most of the snow melted, and I don't know how much they captured with that snow melt. I would like to think they captured everything they could, but you never know. Sometimes they just let it run out to the ocean. Well, and that's when you see that happen, that you just have to go, ah, but I need, you know, you have that. How serious is the water situation right now? It's very serious. Everybody in California should be very concerned. And, uh, and the governor has asked people to conserve water. Um, they, and people have, and I'm talking residential, uh, they've actually used more water than they did last year. Um, and so I think he now has ordered or mandated that water in like, I guess, unnecessary uh, landscaping, like maybe uh, dividers on the highways or maybe factories if they have some lawn, not to water anymore. But the residents have not been mandated to cut back their water. We've been mandated, we've, we've had our water cut. You know, there's no doubt of agriculture, we get cut every year, but, it isn't very often that that residences are cut back. Uh, I hate to say it, you know, it, it almost feels like the state of California doesn't value our agriculture as much as we do and as much as other parts of the country in the world do. I mean, the people come all the way here from Sweden to find out what's going on with their supply, their their uh, source of almonds. It's important to them. And, and yet we don't see that kind of urgency with California. They're just, they just basically say, get used to it. You know, some of you are going to be gone and, and that's it. This is food supply. You can't just, are you going to tell people, well, get used to it. Your food supply, part of your food supply is going to be gone. So get used to it. People aren't going to get used to it. And, and we're trying to save that. We're trying to save the food supply that we all love and, and, and enjoy both in California and out of California. The full MTOM is released each Tuesday. Subscribe via our YouTube channel or wherever you get your podcasts to hear Del Bosque talk about a different labor challenge this year. Next, the Market to Market Report. The weather story paused at week's end for USDA's WASD and Crop Production Report. For the week, the nearby wheat contract added 31 cents, while July improved 46 cents there in corn. A tight bean supply added to the bullish story in the soy complex. The nearby contract gained 48 cents. July meal jumped 21.20 per ton. July cotton expanded 6.88 per hundredweight. Over in the dairy parlor, July Class 3 milk futures added a penny. The livestock sector was mixed. August cattle put on 235, August feeders increased 60 cents, and the July lean hog contract fell 527. In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index improved by 202 ticks. July crude oil strengthened 87 cents per barrel, COMEX gold added 24.10 per ounce, and the Goldman Sachs commodity index gained almost seven points to finish at 811.90. Joining us now to provide some insight, Sue Martin. Hi, Sue. 
Hi there, Paul. Thank you for coming in. Thank you. I wrote the part about the weather because it seems all of a sudden, I mean, weather has been all we've been talking about. We had this report. June's usually insignificant. The report, let's just quickly, we can sum it up. The report today was basically... Neutral negative. Neutral negative. Yeah. So let's start with wheat. Are we at the mercy of Putin only for wheat in the world and in the United States? No. Um, I believe that um, we've got, you know, French wheat has declined for the sixth week consecutively in conditions. You've got Germany, which is a very major producer as well in Europe that's uh, having issues. India, which surprisingly the USDA did not reduce India's uh, production or exports as much as we thought they should. But uh, two um, exports, two million metric tons, and two and a half, I think it was, on the production, where many in the industry think it should be more like at least six. And um, I think that uh, the fact that India banned exports was a major thing. And they didn't only ban exports of uh, wheat, they also banned exports of sugar. And so I think that when you're looking at Yes, um, the situation with Russia and Ukraine. Back in February of 21, when I came off with my projections into 23, of course, I had that was not on my radar. Sure. And um, I think that what we're in is a massive global demand market. And that was a disruption that helped drive this market. But I think that with time, we're still going to see wheat prices evolve higher, but you're heading into harvest. And so right now, you've got a wheat market that, um, of course, surprised everybody at the beginning of the week with 60 cents up because of Putin. But also, then you turn around and we kind of give a chunk of it back. Um, the market's kind of ebbing and flowing right now. And so I think it takes patience. But uh, I don't think we're done in the wheat market. Done, not done. Three percent on the week, uh, but uh, let's look. Let's look at deferred, mostly United States focus now. How does anybody prepare for the weather story that they've had to deal with? Again, wet in the north, dry in the south, and then it turns wet. I mean, Kansas just got dumped on a week ago after we taped this show. They did, but the problem was that was probably a little too late for a chunk of that crop. So I think that, if anything, it's a, uh, the rains were still a good thing as a whole for pastures and maybe for uh, crops coming in after wheat for double cropping. Mm -hmm. um, I think in that light, it was a good thing, but probably for the wheat crop as a whole, a little too late. In corn, uh, the almighty corn continues to try to pop out of the ground. We're facing weather in that story as well. Uh, we're done with this 70s business. It's going to get hot next week. What's that mean? Well, at first, heat should be a good thing because of the fact it's going to give the crop some uh, uh, growing degree uh, energy units, and it's going to encourage growth. So we're going to get the corn, you know, it'll be like you could almost stand there and watch it grow. <laughs> Beans pop out of the ground. It's going to help. But it also is going to cause... Probably, if it's in an area where it's been wet and farmers have mudded crops in, uh, it's probably going to create some crustiness on the, on the uh, ground. So that's not a good thing. But as, if we go past the next two weeks, traders right now are saying, okay, two weeks of heat, we could use that. But if it goes beyond two weeks, then they're going to start to get a little nervous. And, you know, a lot of this crop did go in later than it did a year ago so that means your pollination comes a little later and so traders are certainly going to be on cue because the last thing you need is a weather issue now we have 1.4 billion bushel carryout for 2223 that is nothing real burdensome at all and if you lo start lowering the yield on you know on weather well you've had issues in south america issues around the world, and by the way, uh, traders probably weren't paying attention to the coarse grains globally fell too. So you're going to have some concerns with this crop. We just can't afford any issues. Well, and we had an issue this week in Nebraska and part south with the hail that came in. The yes. pictures were just awful to they see. They were. 
so there's that question of what if that's a million acres there? We talk about this million acres in Minnesota or South Dakota prevent plant. At what point does that all add up and I need to change my philosophy with December? What do I need to think about with that December contract? Well, I think what it does is, first off, a market never pays attention to hail. They always tend to think that that's kind of isolated situations. So the market doesn't pay attention to that. But if you start to get a drought going again, that will ignite this market. And of course, uh, beans all time high, eight or 849 and a half. And we haven't quite made it there uh, on a lead contract, but also keep in mind that was a December contract that did that in 2012. And so you start kicking this in and you could take corn up to $9, 950. Uh, could also probably take beans up too. I mean, they are they the leader of this market right now? Right now they have been. Um, soybeans, what's driving the bean market is the energies. Uh, you look at uh, the demand for crude oil, gasoline prices high, and all of a sudden the need for biofuels or renewable fuels is putting a push under the bean oil and also the lack of tighter supplies around the world of veg oils. And then you look at soybeans and they're bidding like crazy to get them and they're not buying them. And so they're saying, okay, we're at pipeline supplies. Well, in the old days, you know, I was kind of around then, um, the pipeline supply would be viewed as 100 million bushels. Are we still that or are we closer to 200 million bushels with all the huge demand we've got going? You know, I go back and look at the 70s, like 70 to 73, and the things that were happening then are on steroids now. You know, you didn't have a pandemic globally where we do now. And people around the world had given up having reserves where back then reserves were kind of cool. You know, it was an expected thing. But you don't have that now. And these countries have come to the realization they need to build reserves. But right now they're just living hand to mouth. I have not seen anything remotely say we have rationed yet. All right, I have another couple of soybean questions that we'll get to in Market Plus because this cattle market has had its own uh, story and own life this week. Uh, I mean, we're looking uh, at the numbers that continue. The, the, the weights are down, the numbers are up. What, what are you hearing, seeing in this cattle market that is causing this? Well, first off, I think, you know, the beef cow slaughter the first five months of this year was up 115% from last year. And then you look at um, uh, the imports and we're getting cattle, hogs too, from Canada, Mexico, because why? The dollar exchange is huge and it's profitable for the producers in those countries. And also if you look at um, Mexico, they're dealing with a lot of heat also, as is Texas. And the forecast, by the way, for the next 10 days is temperatures like Waco, Texas, as high as 107 degrees, not once, but maybe two or three times, and 104, 102. Um, what's that say for the uh, corn crop there, the cotton crop, but also what about livestock? And Mexico's going through that same thing. So they're sending them into the US and they're lighter weight animals uh, that we're getting. So it's um, again, cattle going into feedlots and you gotta feed them. Yeah, the Southwest is extremely hot. Uh, you can't come too far North because that corn, the feed is expensive. So if I'm someone with a feedlot, where am I finding my feeders? Am I finding them to expand right now? Your feeder cattle or yeah, the grain? Yeah, my feeder cattle. Oh, they're, they aren't having a problem finding feeder cattle. They're getting the feeders because they were moving off of pastures. Now that might slow up a little bit, but another thing we're seeing in that feeder market in the cow-calf herd is individuals that have decided to call it quits and are retiring. Just, it's a lot of work. Um, prices for the calves isn't as good as it should be. And they're just saying, when they look at price, grain prices, they're saying, I'm done, I'm retiring, I'm gonna quit. And you're seeing a fair amount, I think, of that as well. But then they don't have to look too hard because again, we've got cattle coming in from Mexico. So the next thing is, when these cattle are into the feedlots, they'll get lightweight in, they'll be lightweight going out but they gotta have feed for them. I heard yesterday that there was feedlots in Southwest Kansas paying 225 over the board for corn. It's a lot. It that seems a lot. like a lot, but will it be in the end? 
Well, we'll find out. I only have a few seconds left for, for hogs as we wrap up. Just give me a quick yes or no. Is that bottom in? This thing keeps falling. I don't think so. Okay. I think the hog market's going to see uh, drift its way lower to this, you know, the last day or so we've seen an improvement in the cutout or the product, and I think that gave a short covering rally, but I don't think it's done. All right. Guess what is done? Our time in the show. Thank you, Sue. Appreciate it. Went fast. It does. It always does. Thank you. That will do it for this installment of Market to Market. We're going to talk more on Market Plus because we have a whole bunch of your questions to answer. So join us there. You can find that free on our website of markettomarket.org. YouTube has something for everyone, including full episodes, stories, and our Market Plus. Subscribe by going to our page of Market to Market. Ring that bell to be notified each time that we post. Next week, weather and climate take center stage on Capitol Hill. Thank you for watching. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa PBS, which is solely responsible for its content. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Sukup Manufacturing Company, providing equipment and buildings to store and condition grain to help farmers adjust to market swings. We build drying, moving, and storage equipment designed to preserve the quality of their crops. Circuit Manufacturing. Store now. Profit later. Tomorrow. For over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today.